ಸವಿತುರ್ವರ ಜ್ಯೋತಿ ಪರಸ್ಯಧೀಮಹೆ ಯನ್ನ ಸತ್ಯನ ದೀಪೇ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಮೈ ಡಿಯರ್ ಬ್ರದರ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸಿಸ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಫಾರ್ ಟುಡೇ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಅವರ ಬಿಂದು ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಅ ಡಿವೋಟಿ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಕ್ವೈಟ್ ಎಕ್ಕಸ್ಟಮ್ಡ್ ಟು ಟಾಕಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ಟರ್ಮ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಡಿವೋಟೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಅರಬಿಂದು ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಅರಬಿಂದು ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಅ ಗುರು ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೇರ್ ಫೋರ್ ಇಟ್ ಮೇ ಅಪಿಯರ್ ರಾ ದ ಸ್ಟ್ರೇಂಜ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಟಾಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಅರಬಿಂದು ಹಿಮ್ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಅ ಡಿವೋಟಿ ಬಟ್ ಇಫ್ ವಿ ಲುಕ್ ಆಟ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಅರಬಿಂದೋಸ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಇಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ಲಿವ್ಡ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಸರ್ಫೇಸ್ ವಿ ಫೈಂಡ್ ದಟ್ ಎಟ್ ಸೆವರಲ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಹಿ ಎಮರ್ಜಸ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ not only a devotee but in fact a very ardent and sincere devotee in uh, savitri where he takes on the role of ashwapati he is a devotee of the divine mother and uh, invokes her pleads with her to change the consciousness of the human race so that uh, this world will no longer be a place of misery and suffering and uh, apart from this at uh, several points in his life he does emerge as a devotee and uh, that is what we shall try to see soon after he got married in 1901 he wrote a letter to his wife uh, which has become famous as uh, the letter in which he talked about his three madnesses the madness that he wanted this country to be free and he was willing to do anything for it also the badness that he thought that anybody who keeps with himself more than is strictly necessary is a thief but then one of the madnesses was if there is a god i want to see him now if there is a god i want to see him is uh, a desire a wish a curiosity and inquisitiveness of a devotee in the gita there is uh, a verse in the 7th chapter the 16th verse which says chaturvidha bhajante mam janah sukriti norjuna arto jigyasu arthartha gyani cha bharatarshab what it means is that uh, among the virtuous men there are four types of uh, devotees or four types of people who turn to me with love and adoration and uh, these four types are the artha that is the one who is miserable jigyasu the one who is curious or inquisitive the one who is an artharthi that is one who wants uh, some benefit wants something concrete from me and uh, a gyani that is one who is learned and knowledgeable so these are the four categories the miserable the curious or inquisitive uh, the one who has a desire and uh, a knowledgeable learned person now when shorbindo writes to his wife if there is a god i want to see him it is uh, the curiosity the inquisitiveness of a devotee but then by then he had uh, read many of the scriptures like the upanishads in their original in the sanskrit language and therefore he had also become a gyani now why does a gyani still feel the necessity to see god why is he still curious about it why is his approach to the existence of god itself still conditional if there is a god i want to see him why does that approach remain conditional we find something similar in fact happening in the gita in the 10th chapter of the gita shri krishna gives plenty of knowledge to arjun in fact even before that in the 8th and the 9th chapter and even in the preceding chapters he gives him quite a bit of knowledge but in the 10th chapter is the climax of that uh, knowledge which is handed over to arjun in which he tells him that uh, 
this is how i manifest that is how i manifest this is also me that is also me everything that happens in the world is because of me and so on and so forth but uh, arjun is not still fully satisfied in the 11th chapter right at the beginning arjun says i believe everything that you said but i want to see you i want to see you in that form in the form which you have talked about in the 10th chapter that's which means that knowing is different from seeing shorbindo also knew because of all that he had read by 1902 1903 probably when he wrote this letter by then he had learnt a lot from the ancient scriptures and so he had become a gyani he knew but he said i want to see him knowing is different from seeing knowing is only theoretical knowledge seeing is exp- experiential knowledge and uh, one can understand this difference from a very simple example uh, suppose a person has never tasted anything sweet and this person is told that uh, sweetness is a very pleasant taste you feel it on the tongue any food to which we add sugar becomes sweet and uh, these are a few recipe here are a few recipes for making sweets and we may even give him the chemical formula of sugar will that really tell him anything about what sweetness is probably not much on the other hand you give him a sweet and tell him put it in your mouth and then ask him now what you felt is sweetness now he exactly knows what sweetness is no further description is necessary so all the descriptions that we gave him become redundant once he has actually experienced sweetness now if that applies to an ordinary sensory experience like sweetness one can understand how much more true it will be of a rather unusual suprasensory experience like uh, experiencing the divine that experience will be so different from any descriptions that have been provided to us by those who have seen him upanishads are essentially the descriptions which the rishis have given us the rishis who had seen the divine they have then tried to express it in their own way in words in scriptures like the upanishads but uh, that still remains for us theoretical knowledge it remains uh, the infinite compressed into finite words it doesn't satisfy our curiosity fully but uh, we have a tendency out of respect for the rishis to trust that and say that well if they have said so it must be so and we ourselves don't have uh, the enough of curiosity enough of uh, that aspiration enough of that persistence uh, and discipline which is required to actually experience the divine and therefore we generally leave it at that we just trust the rishis for what they have said but here was an unusual seeker an aspirant a devotee who had that curiosity that jigyasa to actually see and therefore he said if there is a god i want to see him so the combination of a gyani and a jigyasu is not uh, impossible in fact they are perfectly compatible there can be jigyasa without being a gyani but then there can be jigyasa or curiosity in spite of being a gyani or a knowledgeable learned person and uh, that is what shorbindo was when he wrote this letter to his wife that uh, he wants to see god if there is one and uh, this curiosity was in spite of his having become a learned man who knew all the scriptures and had with him all the descriptions provided by the rishis who had seen the divine then we find that uh, in 1907 in fact a little before that he started uh, practicing uh, some yogic uh, practices till then in spite of having read so many scriptures he was not very interested in uh, actually practicing any of the yogic practices because he f- probably felt that uh, that is uh, more uh, an outer expression and outer practice and external practice which is not required if uh, uh, you have something within you and that change is going on within you this uh, external things are not necessary but uh, then you know when a person is desperate then he is willing to do anything and uh, after 1905 particularly he was desperate to see the country free that was another one of his madnesses which he talked about when he wrote to his wife that uh, i want the country to be free free from the clutches of the demon that is sucking the blood of my mother my motherland and uh, he looked upon india as the motherland as his mother bharat mata and therefore he said that i want to free her 
Now, by 1905, he was desperate for it. And then he was willing to try even yogic practices. And finally, when he was uh, referred to a yoga guru, uh, Vishnu Bhaskar Lele, he told him that, please teach me yoga so that I can acquire those powers which will help me free the country. Now, here again he was a devotee. But then what type of a devotee? An artharthi. He wanted something. Not something material, not something personally for himself. But all the same, he wanted something. He had an aspiration, which is uh, a sort of an enlightened desire. And uh, he had this aspiration that uh, I want the country to be free. And for that, I'm willing to do anything. And one of the things was that he wanted to learn yoga. And uh, practic practicing yoga in that spirit is also the spirit of a devotee. In fact, an artharthi who wants something is one of the categories of devotees which Sri Krishna has described among those four categories. So it means that uh, an artharthi who wants something is not necessarily one who is an ordinary uh, person who is just looking for some material benefits. There can be higher types of things that we may expect from the divine, like say, peace in this world. That is also something which... Uh, Sri Aurobindo was looking for. In that sense, again, he was an artharthi. He wanted something from the divine. When he uh, asked the divine mother in Savitri that this is what I want. I will not be satisfied with my personal salvation. I want the salvation of the human race as a whole. Now, again, he was an artharthi, but a very enlightened and uh, uh, universal type of uh, an aspiration. But all the same, it was an aspiration. Now, here his aspiration was that the country should be free. And... For that, he was approaching the divine through yogic practices. And uh, so, he was an artharthi. So, being uh, a jnani, which he was by then, and uh, being a jigyasu or an inquisitive person, as he wrote in that letter to his wife, that did not prevent him from also becoming a devotee as an artharthi. He wanted something. So, that is in that spirit that he turned to uh, Vishnu Bhaskar Lele. Now then we further move on to 1908 when he was imprisoned and brought to jail. And uh, what was one of the first things that he did? He was miserable. And he asked the divine this question, why have you brought me here? I was engaged in such, the no such a noble task like the freedom struggle. Why did you interrupt that work? Now he was remembering the divine like a devotee, but then how? As an artha, as someone who was miserable. So in spite of being a, a jnani and a, a jigyasu, a learned man and an inquisitive man who wanted to see God, and uh, being uh, an artharthi, that is one who wanted from the divine freedom of the country, did not prevent him from becoming an artha. Just as, you know, Rama, when he lost his wife, in spite of being an avatar, they did not prevent him from crying out, where is she? Why, are you, why am I suffering? Where has she gone? He cried out. He knew everything, and yet he behaved as if he didn't know where she was. And he had to get the help, help of the uh, Garuda and uh, uh, Hanuman and so on to locate her. So an avatar, when he takes on uh, a human form, they also takes on the limitations of a human being. And uh, that is what Sri was doing in prison, uh, crying out to, to Lord Krishna in uh, this state of misery. And once again came back that conditional approach, if you are there, you know what I want. And it's not something that I want for myself. It's not something personal that I'm looking for. I want something for the country. I want something for the world. Because he always believed that uh, uh, when India is free and India rises, it will be for the world. It will not be just for itself. And uh, this is the type of aspiration I have. This is what I want. And I was busy with it. And you interrupted me by bringing me here to this prison. So now he was an art. And uh, the reply came. The reply came that the bonds that you could not break, I have broken for you. What bonds? The attachment to the freedom struggle. The feeling that I'm indispensable for it. These are also bonds and they had been broken. They had been broken because his 
true mission in life was something different as was revealed later and we'll not go into that his mission was for the world as a whole not just to get political freedom for the country and for that whatever he had to do he had more or less done by 1908 when he was in prison and therefore this intervention at that point by the divine itself to interrupt his work and to reveal him during that one year in prison the ultimate mission of his life why he was here on earth but then he behaves like an arthur so by now we have seen that uh, he has uh, uh, given uh, sort of uh, in different stages in feeling as if he is a devotee and a devotee of different types a gyani a jigyasu an artharthi and also an arth and uh, then we move on to his uh, release from prison in 1909 by now he was uh, not just uh, a devotee he had become a rishi he had seen the divine he had seen the divine in its unmanifest form as a result of uh, the meditation into which he went after getting some instructions from uh, vishnu bhaskar lele that is when he experienced the unmanifest divine and then in prison he experienced the manifest divine as krishna krishna everywhere krishna in the walls of the prison krishna in the bars of the door krishna in, uh, in the trees and krishna in the jailers and the krishna and krishna in the uh, blankets which covered him at night he felt you know as if it was krishna's arms that had embraced him uh, it was not those blankets and uh, krishna in the defense council krishna in the uh, prosecution council and uh, krishna in the judge so everywhere in the krishna in the other inmates of the prison including those who were there in prison for very serious crimes now he had seen krishna in each one of these things each one of these people every type of creation he had seen krishna and so he had experienced the manifest divine now this type of a complete realization of the unmanifest divine and the manifest divine had made him a rishi but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that he was not a devotee anymore even a rishi can be a devotee and that he continued to be and how do we know that we know because uh, what are the characteristics of a true devotee the characteristics of a true devotee was that now he knows the divine and therefore can talk to the divine that is what he did in prison he could have a dialogue with shri krishna and ask him tell me clearly what is it that you expect of me to continue with the freedom struggle or something else and he was told that it is something else that is expected of you for this country as well as for the world as a whole for this country wake up this country from its slumber and for the world as a whole work for uh, the rise in its consciousness by giving it the wisdom that only you have the wisdom that only you can give in the form in which the world needs it today now this is the type of mission that was revealed to him when uh, he had this dialogue with shri krishna in prison and uh, now he had become familiar with this voice he recognized this voice and he had learned to act on this voice without asking any questions that is again the characteristic of a devotee and uh, that is what happened when uh, one day he was told in 1910 go to chandarnagar and he immediately left for chandarnagar after spending 39 days or so in chandarnagar came the same voice which he had now learned to recognize and not to question and that voice told him go to pondicherry he had started treating these as an adesh as a command and uh, that is how he once again continued to behave like a devotee now it's a relatively short period from his selfish life that i have talked about from 1902 through 1910 and within this period we find that uh, 
he appears to be a devotee in different ways one out of those four varieties that uh, shri krishna has talked about in the gita as uh, a jigyasu or an inquisitive person as a gyani or a learned person as an arthartha who wants something as an artha who is miserable and then finally also as a rishi and a maharshi and uh, in fact once he did say when he was asked why he went to chandranagar why he went to pondicherry he said because it was told to me in a voice by which i had by then become familiar and i had stopped obeying sorry i had stopped questioning that voice and i had started obeying that voice without asking any questions now that is what a devotee is about i learned this with a little story which i had picked up from manoj da uh, who left his body recently and uh, the story is uh, based on the ramayan hanuman is one of the epitome of a perfect devotee one day when there were some monkeys having a competition amongst themselves about uh, who could jump the longest and hanuman was just watching and then one of the monkeys came and told him that why don't you also participate because uh, we know that you can jump much longer than any of them uh, why are you just watching and the answer that hanuman gave is remarkable the answer that hanuman gave was i do not want to spend even an ounce of my energy which is not spent in the service of ram now that is a perfect devotee every ounce of my energy is reserved for the service of ram and that is what shri arbindo also did after he went to pondicherry in 1910 till he left his body in 1950 he kept doing at different stages in different forms what was expected of him by the divine and uh, every ounce of his energy was used for that one single mission and uh, in response to that one single voice which he had now come to trust fully and to obey without asking any questions and this with a prayer om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnamevavashishyate om shanti shanti shanti